welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. This season, we are following the story of nationalism and how we, meaning humankind, came from an age of empires and kingdoms to one of modern nation-states. And a big part of that story, big part of how different people differentiate themselves from each other is religion. That is part and parcel of many national identities. Now, in the Christian world, by which I mean most of Europe, the break between Protestants and Catholics during the Renaissance uh, led to wars and fueled national rivalries, many of which still exist on a much lower level today. But even before the split between the Protestants and the Catholics, there was an earlier split. And that split is called the Great Schism. This is the divide between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Churches. Now, we've touched on the Great Schism a little bit in the past, right? It came from two main causes. First were some religious matters, mostly things that modern people really wouldn't understand, for the most part, why... Uh, they were such a big deal. Right? Things like the exact nature of the relationship between God the Father and God the Son, or whether one uses leavened or unleavened bread for the Eucharist, right? Those are things that might be different between religions today, but nobody's going to go to war over them. They were a little bit more important to people of the time. And the other main cause of the Great Schism was how the church itself was going to be organized. See, the Eastern churches, what we would call today the Orthodox churches, favored the model of the Emperor Justinian. And he had established the idea of the Pentarchy. This is a model where five different major bishops would rule over the church. And these were the bishops of Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria. Meanwhile, the Roman Catholic Church preached the doctrine of papal supremacy, right? The bishop of Rome is in charge of the church. These were things that had been debated for some time, but long story short... In the year 1054, the Pope and the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated each other simultaneously. Now, in and of itself, this wasn't shocking. Throughout the course of history, there had been a number of debates and splits within the Christian Church during the uh, middle of the first millennium. You had uh, what we now call the Arian heresy, which was a major divide in Christianity that lasted for hundreds of years. But none of these breaks had been permanent. Right In the end, the Christian churches had always eventually reconciled, and in fact, a casual observer in the late 10 hundreds could easily have assumed that the Eastern and Western churches were on the verge of getting back together. In 1096, Pope Urban II called the First Crusade at the specific request of Byzantine Emperor Alexios Komnenos, and he did it for the express purpose of helping fellow Christians. And yet, the Pope and the Patriarch of Constantinople would not lift their mutual excommunications until 1974. 
and the churches are, in fact, still separate. Well, what happened? This isn't just about religion. In fact, arguably the greatest aspect of the divide between the Eastern and Western churches is a betrayal that still stings over 800 years later. This is about the destruction of an ancient empire by people who were supposed to be its friends. This is the story of the Fourth Crusade and how a Roman Catholic army pillaged Constantinople. And if you want to understand this divide between East and West, you have got to understand this crusade. But before we get into today's story, just a couple of things to announce here. First, shout out to Tim from St. Louis. Thank you so much for your patronage. And about that Patreon account, well, in addition to a shout out and access to the private Discord server, Patrons of the show now get access to an exclusive video every month. This video is a new series called Dan's War School, and it's going to be a 20 to 30 minute deep dive into a particular battle from history. This first month, June 1st, we'll be discussing the first and so far last cavalry charge of the 21st century at Mazar-e-Sharif. And the other announcement is that I will now be producing a show for the Salad Tossers Network. This is a quirky network. I've done an interview with these guys in the past, a couple of young guys who now have a handful of partners on their Patreon network doing shows on a variety of topics. And I'll have a link to that in the description as well. Now, with the announcements over, let's talk about the Fourth Crusade. Well, the story of the Fourth Crusade really starts in March of 1193. It is at that time that the Ayyubid Sultan, Saladin, dies. And... The death of Saladin throws his entire kingdom into chaos. His brother, Safadin, is based out of Damascus and ends up ruling most of the old Ayyubid territory. But Safadin's brother, Al-Aziz, is ruling in Egypt, and the two sides are not getting along. Meanwhile... There is also chaos in the Byzantine Empire during this decade. In the year 1195, there is a palace coup in Byzantium in the city of Constantinople. Emperor Alexios III takes the throne, deposes his brother Isaac II, and puts out his eyes and throws him into prison. And this weakens the Byzantine Empire, which had been fighting with the Ayyubids for some time, on and off. And it weakens the Byzantine Empire because Alexios has to bribe a number of officials just to be able to keep the throne. These are expensive enough bribes that they deplete the treasury. And... This is not the only challenge that the Byzantines are facing in this time period. Right? The empire has also been isolated commercially. This is weird for a somewhat powerful empire to not have a whole lot of trade. Well, the reason the empire has trouble with trade is that Uh, The Egyptians don't want to trade with them because they've been at war. And the Venetians and Genoans, these two 
Italian city-states, well, they're the two other major trading powers in the Mediterranean, and they don't want to trade with the Byzantines either. Not too long ago, they had been trading. There was an entire neighborhood in Constantinople populated by Italians. And these Italian merchants became a power of their own within the empire, and it ended up causing a lot of friction. And in 1182, a mob in the city had murdered thousands of these Italians, an event called the Massacre of the Latins. They had even beheaded the Pope's personal representative and dragged his head through the street. And the emperor at the time had done nothing to punish the people for all this, and in response, the Venetians and Genoans had stopped trading with Byzantium, and they were isolated. This leads to an opportunity, though, for the crusaders in the Middle East. Right? Previously, the crusaders have been constrained by the Ayyubid Sultanate and the Byzantine Empire. But with both of those powers weakened, well, they have an opportunity to gain some more land. Well, we've got Two factors so far leading to the Fourth Crusade, right? We've got instability and division in the Ayyubid Sultanate, and we've got instability and isolation in the Byzantine Empire. Well, in 1198, a third ingredient is added to this recipe. See, Pope Celestine III dies that year, and a new pope, Innocent III, takes over. Now, in this time period, it is not uncommon for a pope to call a crusade shortly after taking power. Think of it sort of like a new U.S. president announcing some kind of bold initiative in their first hundred days, right? That's pretty common, well, at this time, it's common for a pope to call a crusade more or less right away, and Pope Innocent does. And he calls for an attack against Egypt. His reasoning is that with the Ayyubid Sultanate split, Egypt should be relatively easy to take over. Right? The crusaders have been beating their heads against the Syrian and Mesopotamian parts of the Ayyubid Sultanate for some time now, and achieving nothing. And so it makes sense to attack the much more vulnerable area of Egypt. In addition to that, Egypt is a major producer of grain, food, that feeds much of the Muslim world. And if the Crusaders can take over Egypt, they can then deprive the rest of the Ayyubid Sultanate of food, and maybe then they can take over Jerusalem or Damascus. Now, this is actually an argument that has been made before. Right? On the Third Crusade, Richard the Lionheart wanted to attack Egypt and was ultimately overruled by his own lieutenants, but it's interesting to think what could have happened then, and once again, we have a major Christian leader calling for a crusade against Egypt. But the papal call really goes unheeded for about a year. Nobody takes Innocent III up on his call. But that changes in 1199. See, that year, a young French lord named Count Theobald of Champagne holds a tournament. And at that tournament, he takes the cross. He swears to go on crusade. And peer pressure takes over, and a bunch of other knights, mostly French, also take the cross. Among these are some 
men named Simon of Montfort and Louis of Blois. Those are major players in the Fourth Crusade. And upon hearing of this, another big player in European politics, Baldwin IX of Flanders, well, he finds out that there's a crusade about to happen, and he takes the cross himself. And the last major player to join in this crusade is a lord named Boniface of Montferrat. And he has a personal stake because he is the younger brother of the former, now deceased, king of Jerusalem, King Conrad. Now, what you'll notice about all of these guys, with the exception of Boniface of Montferrat, is the fact that they're all very young. Boniface is 49, but Theobald, the guy who started all this, he's only 20 years old. Louis of Blois is 27, Simon of Montfort is 23, and Baldwin IX of Flanders is either 26 or 27. Now this puts the Fourth Crusade in contrast with the previous couple of Crusades, which were led by kings and senior statesmen, right? Richard the Lionheart, who more or less led the Third Crusade, was in his 30s at the time and was at least an experienced soldier, right? But Pope Innocent approves of this Crusade, the target is Cairo, and there is a specific ban on attacking any Christian states in the course of this crusade. This is something the Pope puts in there because not too long ago, just a few years ago, the Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI had extorted the Byzantines for a bunch of money while marching an army through on his crusade. So the Pope wants to make sure that you know, nobody's extorting any fellow Christian countries, even if these guys are Eastern Christians over there. We're not going to do that. At least not in theory. Now, earlier crusades had generally traveled over land. And if you're trying to get to the Middle East from anywhere in Europe and you're going over land, well, you're going to be going right through the Byzantine Empire. And with relations between the Byzantine world and the Western world increasingly strained, the Crusaders decide to invade Egypt by sea. They're going to avoid that land route altogether. They're also going to shave months off their travel time. And they might just take the Egyptians by surprise. But to mount this naval invasion, they're going to need a big fleet. And at the time, there are only a couple of places in Europe that are capable of building a fleet on the scale that the Crusaders are going to need. These two places are the two major Italian trading powers that we already talked about, Genoa and Venice. Genoa is located on the northern Mediterranean coast just to the west of the Italian peninsula, and Venice is kind of tucked in at the northern coast of the Adriatic, just to the east of the Italian peninsula. But you'll notice that these two major Italian trading powers are not actually on Italy itself, on the peninsula. Well, the reason is, if you're trying to trade by sea up further into Europe, right, up into France and Germany and those areas, well, the further north on the Mediterranean you can get, the better off you are. Having a trading port on the boot of Italy actually adds time to your journey because you have to go over land and go through the Alps and all, all kinds of things like that. Much better just to take your shipping to Genoa or Venice 
And as a result, these two city-states were incredibly powerful at the time. Venice, for a few centuries, punches way above its weight in particular and dominates the eastern Mediterranean. But even so, making this fleet for the Crusaders will be a huge undertaking. Whichever one of these city-states, Genoa or Venice, decides to take on that mission, they're going to have to shut down all commercial operations for a year. They're going to have to put their entire economy to work just to build this fleet. And to that offer, the Genoans say thanks, but no thanks. Here is where we meet the true leader of the Fourth Crusade, a man named Enrico Dandolo, the Doge of Venice. Between 91 and 92 years old, Dandolo is one of the few elected leaders in Europe. He's been a businessman all his life, but he actually was not emancipated until his own father's death when he was 67 years old. So we don't know much about his early life since anything he did, any transactions or deals that he was a part of, well, at the end of the day, they would have had his father's name on them and not his. But whatever he did... Despite the fact that he was not emancipated, I mean, he was 67 years old and he was clearly accomplished because the very year of his father's death, uh, in 1174, a 67-year-old Dandolo led a diplomatic mission to Constantinople, which was successful. Around the same time, he also went blind. Some chroniclers say that he was blinded by the Byzantine emperor. Others say that he was blinded suddenly by a blow to the head in some kind of accident. Most likely the modern consensus is that he went blind over the course of a few years due to some natural cause. The reason historians think that is because uh, you can see his uh, signature deteriorate over a few years during this time, going from a very neat signature to just a sort of scrawl. But despite his blindness, Dandolo would remain in public service for the rest of his life. And in the year 1192, at the age of 85, he would be elected the Doge of Venice. In a few short years, he would make a number of important changes. Most importantly, in the mid-1190s, he reforms the currency system. See, previous administrations had been debasing Venice's old silver coins by adding a bunch of cheaper metals into them, and as a result, they were worth less. So what Dandolo had done was issued entirely new coins in uh, a three-denomination system, right? small, medium, and large. And these large coins were called grossos, and they would be the first large-denomination coins made of pure silver to be minted in Europe in over 500 years. Right? That goes to show you how powerful and rich Venice is during this time period in the late 1190s. And Dandolo is not just an economic leader. Despite its small size, because it's wealthy and it has a lot of ships, Venice can deploy a large navy and can hire mercenary armies when needed, and he leads a military expedition, Dandolo does, against the city of Zadar. That's a port city on the Adriatic in modern-day Croatia. 
this is a city that had belonged to Venice in the past, but had revolted in the 1180s and was now under the protection of Hungary. Here on the Adriatic, not far away, Venice was now dealing with a competitor. Dandolo's expedition there would fail, but he would keep trying to think of ways to get back this city of Zadar. As it turns out, the Fourth Crusade will present him with an opportunity to do just that. So, in the summer of 1201, this embassy arrives from Baldwin IX of Flanders to Enrico Dandolo to try to negotiate building a fleet. This embassy includes a low-ranking knight named Geoffrey de Villehardouin, and we will draw a lot from his memoirs since he was present for a number of important events during this crusade. And what Geoffrey tells us is that Dandolo agrees to build a fleet for the crusaders. And he agrees to do this at a cost of four silver marks per horse and two per man and that for this price, the Venetians will provide transport for 4,500 mounted knights, 9,000 squires, and 20,000 foot soldiers. And in addition to that, the Venetians will provide a fleet of armed assault ships to assist with the crusade. Now, in exchange, what the Venetians ask for is... 84,000 silver marks upon delivery of the fleet, right? That is the cost per man. And then they also want 50% of the loot that they get on the crusade, right? If they raid any cities or anything like that, uh, the Venetians are going to get their cut. And that's their compensation for providing these assault ships. Well, the ambassadors agree, and it's going to take a full year for this fleet to be built. But because this crusade is run by a bunch of junior nobles, central leadership is more or less non-existent. So instead of everyone coming to Venice to leave from there, about half of the crusaders end up obtaining their own transport to the Middle East from wherever they are in Europe. So the Venetians shut down their economy for an entire year to build this fleet, but instead of 33,500 crusaders showing up, in May of 1202, only 12,000 show up. Well, this messes up the pricing, right? At a cost of four marks per horse and two marks per man, assuming the original army, the cost for the fleet came to 84,000 marks. Well, that's still what the Venetians are expecting, but that means each crusader is going to have to come up with nearly three times what they would have had to originally pay. At first, the Crusaders are only able to come up with 35,000 marks. Dandolo holds out, and the Crusaders are able to raise another 15,000 marks, but they still owe the Venetians 34,000 marks, and the war hasn't even started. And this puts Dandolo in a pickle. There's a principle that if you owe the bank a little bit of money, that's your problem. But if you owe the bank a lot of money, that's their problem. Right? He has shut down his entire economy for a year. He better have something to show for it. So Dandolo comes up with a compromise. He will allow the fleet to leave provided that on their way to the Holy Land, the Crusaders will stop in this Croatian city of Zadar and help the Venetians retake it. He is going to wipe clean the Crusaders' debt in exchange for them helping him 
with this little trade problem he's been dealing with in the Adriatic. And what's remarkable is that despite being 95 years old and blind, Enrico Dandolo decides to go on crusade himself. This is how Geoffrey of Villehardouin describes the event. Quote, Before the beginning of High Mass, the Doge of Venice, who bore the name of Henry Dandolo, went up into the reading desk and spoke to the people and said to them, Signors, you are associated with the most worthy people in the world, and for the highest enterprise ever undertaken, and I am a man old and feeble, who should have need of rest, and I am sick in body. But I see that no one could command and lead you like myself, who am your Lord. If you will consent that I take the sign of the cross to guard and direct you, and that my son remain in my place to guard the land, then I shall go to fight or die with you and with the pilgrims. And when they heard him, they cried with one voice, We pray you, by God, that you consent and do it, and that you come with us. Very great, then, was the compassion on the part of the people of the land and of the pilgrims, and many were the tears shed, because that worthy and good man would have had so much reason to remain behind, for he was an old man, and albeit his eyes were unclouded, yet he saw not, having lost his sight through a wound in the head. He was of great heart. Ah, how little like him were those who had gone to other ports to escape the danger. Thus he came down from the reading desk, and went before the altar, and knelt upon his knees greatly weeping. And they sewed the cross onto a great cotton hat, which he wore in front, because he wished that all men should see it. Unquote. But the highest enterprise ever taken that Dandolo speaks of is not a holy war, or even a war of conquest. It's a war for Venetian profit. And at this time, this is already controversial among the Crusaders. Zadar is a Christian city. It is a Catholic one, in fact, and if you'll remember, Pope Innocent specifically forbade the Crusaders from attacking any Christian cities. This is not a valid target, and many of the leaders, including most notably Simon of Montfort, protest the decision, although they go along for now. And I should also mention here that at this time, right before the Crusade takes off, Theobald dies, the young man who had called the crusade in the first place, and the main crusader leader is now 52-year-old Boniface of Montferrat. And this will be important in a minute. Now, the Venetian fleet that the crusaders are able to travel in, this is a truly impressive fleet. It consists of 50 troop transports. These boats are about 90 feet long and about 30 feet wide. And there are about 100 horse transports of a similar size. These horse transports are actually built with individual stalls for each horse where the animals can be strapped in for transport on rough seas. And they actually have ramps built into the aft of the ships so that they can be lowered right onto a beach and the knights can literally come riding directly off the ship and into battle if need be. It's like a medieval tank landing ship. And then the warships that the Venetians are sending, well, there are 60 of them, manned by 14,000 Venetian sailors. And they have big metal rams on the front for assault, and then they have uh, siege engines, uh, basically uh, catapults, uh, mounted on the decks. 
this is an impressive military force. And it's going to besiege a city that doesn't even know it's about to be attacked. And the fleet proceeds down the Adriatic coast along the way, pacifying a few smaller cities, uh, Trieste, uh, Mugia, and Pula. And all three of them submit to Venetian rule without a fight. And it is the hope of many crusaders that Zadar will do the same. Well, on November 10th, 1202 the fleet finally arrives at Zadar. The city is well defended with a chain across the harbor. Their leaders nonetheless initially offer to surrender, but while they are waiting for Enrico Dandolo to deliberate with some of the crusader leaders, they are advised not to by Simon of Montfort. He tells them not to surrender, The crusaders are only bluffing, and no French crusader would actually attack a Christian city. And so the negotiators from Zadar decide to go back to the city and not to surrender. And as it turns out, most of the crusaders are quite willing to assault a city full of fellow Christians. The Venetian ships smash through the chains, blocking the harbor, and the crusaders encamp on the land in front of the city. Still, there is some contention in the ranks. This is a controversial move, and the Pope himself has gotten involved. Robert of Clary A French knight, who was present at the time, writes, Now the men of Zadar knew full well that the men of Venice hated them. Therefore had they procured a letter from Rome to the effect that whoever should make war upon them or should do them any hurt would be excommunicated. And they sent this letter by trusty messengers to the doge and to the pilgrims who had come thither. When the messengers came to the host, Then was the letter read before the doge and before the pilgrims. When the letter was read and the doge had heard it, he said that not for all the pontiff's excommunication would he refrain from avenging himself of them of the city. Thereupon the messengers went their ways. Then spoke the doge a second time to the barons, and he said to them, Sirs, be it known to you that not in any wise would I refrain from avenging myself of them, not for the pontiff himself. And he besought them that they might aid him. The barons made answer all that they would aid him gladly, all save Count Simon of Montfort and my lord Engerend of Bovis. They said that they would in no wise go against the commandment of the pontiff, nor did they at all desire to be excommunicated. So they turned away and went to Hungary to abide there through the winter. When the doge saw that the barons would aid him, He caused his engines to be set up to assault the city, until they of the city saw that they could not hold out against them. Then they came to terms and surrendered the city to them. Then did the pilgrims and the Venetians enter therein, and they divided the city into two halves, so that the pilgrims had the one half thereof, and the Venetians the other. Unquote. So the Venetians and the Crusaders decide to spend the winter in Zadar. But tensions are high between the two groups. As a matter of fact, at one point, fighting breaks out between Venetians and French soldiers in the city, and it goes on for more than a day. A number of people are killed. Enrico Dandolo and Boniface of Montferrat both have to personally intervene and go out and tell people to stop fighting. And at this point, Pope Innocent makes a mistake. See, with the conquest of Zadar, a fait accompli, he decides to grant absolution to the crusader leaders who should have been excommunicated. He forgives them. It's 
not hard to understand why he is criticized for this. After all, if Pope Innocent is not going to follow through on his threats, then why wouldn't the Crusaders go on to pillage even more Christian cities, right? Makes sense. They just got away with it once. Now, as it happens, Innocent had sent messages condemning the Venetians for the attack on Zadar, a step short of excommunication, but Boniface had the messages intercepted and destroyed so they never arrived. And the reason this is a big deal is because the idea of this crusade attacking another Christian city is not hypothetical. At this very moment, Enrico Dandolo and Boniface of Montferrat are planning to do exactly that. Let's rewind a bit. At the beginning of the episode, we talked about how the Byzantine Emperor Alexios III had recently taken power in a coup. Well, as it turns out, his brother Isaac, the rightful emperor, had a son, a rightful heir. And that son has been growing up in Germany for the past few years. Here's how Robert of Clary sums up the coup and the survival of this heir. He says, quote, Thereafter it chanced one day that the emperor went hunting in his forest. And what did Alexius his brother do but come into the forest where the emperor was and seize him treacherously and put out his eyes? Thereafter, when he had done this, he caused him to be cast into prison, albeit none knew a word thereof. And when he had done this, back came he to Constantinople, and caused it to be noised abroad that the emperor his brother was dead and he had himself crowned emperor by force. But when the tutor of the emperor Isaac's son knew that the child's uncle had betrayed his father and made himself emperor by treachery, what did he do but take the child and cause him to be carried into Germany, to his sister, who was wife to the emperor of Germany? For he desired not that the child's uncle should have him put to death, and the child was more the rightful heir than was Alexius his uncle. Unquote. Well, in the winter of 1202, the now 20-year-old Alexios IV, this heir, asks for help. He asks for help from his host, Philip of Swabia, the German king who took him in. And it so happens that Philip is also the liege lord to Boniface of Montferrat, this crusader leader. The complex system of feudal obligations rears its head here, as it so often does. And Alexios IV is able to use this connection to make a plea for help. He makes an offer to the crusaders and the Venetians. In exchange for their help deposing his traitorous uncle, Alexios III, he will pay them 200,000 marks. He will feed their army, and he will send troops with them to Egypt and force the Patriarch of Constantinople to submit to the Pope. This is a remarkable list of promises. Now, Another debate breaks out amongst the Crusaders at this point, and a less greedy leader could probably have stopped them from agreeing, simply because Alexios IV, if he's able to get back his throne, he's probably not going to have any way to keep these promises. He's certainly not going to be able to force the Patriarch of Constantinople to submit to the Pope. He's probably not going to be able to come up with 200,000 marks either. That is literally billions of dollars in today's money. But despite the fact that Enrico Dandolo, of all people, should know better, he 
pushes his fellow crusaders to agree to help Alexios, and so does Boniface, right? After all, Alexios has been vouched for by Boniface as liege lord. Uh, it's in his interest to try and back this guy and try and get him on the Byzantine throne. And the crusader leaders agree to do this, even though it means attacking yet another Christian city. And at this decision to attack Constantinople, Simon of Montfort and his faction leave in disgust. They travel via land back to Italy, and they charter their own ships to the kingdom of Jerusalem. And they do arrive there at the capital city of Acre, but King Amory of Jerusalem is unwilling to participate in a crusade at this time. Some knights who have gone on this crusade enter the service of the crusader states, but at this point most of them go home. As a result, the Fourth Crusade is remembered almost entirely for the actions of those individuals who traveled with Boniface and with Enrico Dandolo. Now, Pope Innocent finds out that the Crusaders are on their way to attack Constantinople, and he sends more messages, this time threatening to excommunicate anyone who participates. Well, the Crusader leaders intercept and destroy these messages in order to keep the rank-and-file troops from finding out. And, let's be honest, the leaders themselves may not even believe the Pope's threats at this point. Innocent has lost control of the situation. Like a few popes during the Crusades, he learns that with his spiritual authority, he can call for a crusade. But once that crusade gets started, he can't really control what happens. Even so, we should recognize that from here on out, these individuals who are attacking Constantinople are not technically crusaders. I will keep calling them that for the sake of simplicity and narrative continuity, but in fact they have abandoned any pretense of a holy war. A crusade by definition is a holy war called by the Pope. So when the Pope is saying, don't do this, don't do this, really don't do this, and you're doing it anyway, you are not on a crusade, my friend. Right, the... Venetians are now engaged in a war for plunder, pure and simple, with the French acting as mercenaries. Upon arriving at Constantinople, the crusaders find that the golden horn has been blocked off by a chain, much like the harbor outside Zadar. Now, the golden horn is a natural harbor that sits right next to the city of Constantinople on the European side. And that is the most vulnerable side of the city, right? The rest of the city is surrounded by these massive walls and towers, and they're very strongly defended, and there's no way this Crusader army is ever going to get through uh, those defenses. But... If they can break into the Golden Horn, into this natural harbor, they can access some lower parts of the walls, some parts of the city that are not well defended. So to get into the Golden Horn, they decide that they're going to attack the weakest part of this chain. right? This chain that's blocking off the harbor that goes from the southeast bank, right, by the city itself, to a tower called the Tower of Galata on the northeast bank of the harbor, right, of the Golden Horn. So the Crusaders land on the north bank, and they start besieging this tower on June 23rd. Uh, the north bank is 
lightly defended, but they make use of these landing ships and knights come charging out of the ships and just sort of scatter the Byzantine defensive force and the Crusaders are able to sort of invest this tower, build some barricades around it and try and starve out the defenders. And on July 11th, the tower's defenders make one final sally out to try and fight the French soldiers, and they're defeated, and the crusaders are then able to get into this tower and get at the end of the chain and break it. And so on July 11th, Venetian ships sail inside the Golden Horn, and the French ground troops are able to cross over and begin the siege in earnest. Now, as I mentioned, the city of Constantinople is fairly well defended. There's a little over 15,000 troops defending it, so the Crusaders' best shot is to try and win through diplomacy. So they parade Alexios IV, this rightful heir, in front of the walls. They put him up on top of Venetian galley, and he's waving to the people in the city, proclaiming that he's come to take his rightful throne, and you know, instead of the people of Constantinople supporting him, uh, the city's defenders shoot arrows at him. Well, at this point, the Crusaders once again have to change tactics. If diplomacy's not going to work and there aren't enough of them to effectively besiege the city, well, they're going to have to try a direct assault. A week later, on July 18th, they do just that. The French knights attack the city by land, while the Venetians launch a coordinated attack by sea, and Enrico Dandolo personally leads a beach landing with uh, crossbowmen, despite being very old and blind. And in response to this attack, the usurper emperor, Alexios III, uh, he leads a counterattack against some of the French knights. Now, his force in this part of the fight consists of 8,500 men that outnumbers the French knights by about two to one. Alexios should have the advantage here, but he seems simply to lose his nerve. Here's how Robert of Clary describes the day's events. Quote, and the battalions of the emperor and our own battalions had by now drawn so near together that the emperor's crossbowmen were shooting into the midst of our people, and our own crossbowmen likewise into the midst of the emperor's people, and there remained but one hillock to climb betwixt the emperor and our battalions and the emperor's battalions were ascending it on the one side and ours on the other. And when our people came to the top of the hill and the emperor saw them, he halted, and all his people also. And they were so dismayed and confounded, because our battalions were riding thus abreast against them, that they knew not what counsel to take. In the meantime, as they stood there thus confounded, the other battalions of the emperor, which had been sent around the host of the Franks, withdrew themselves and went back and all joined themselves with the emperor in the valley. And when the Franks saw all the emperor's battalions thus joined together, they stood stock still on the top of the hillock and wondered what the emperor meant to do. And the counts and the chief men of the three battalions sent messengers, the one to the others, to take counsel what they should do and whether they should advance clean up to the emperor's host or not. And they found none to counsel that they go thither, for they were far away from the host, and if they fought there where the emperor was, they who were guarding the host could no longer see them, or, if need be, bring them any help. And on the other hand, there lay betwixt them and the emperor a great canal, a great conduit, through which water went to Constantinople, which, if they should cross, they would suffer great loss of their men. 
and for this reason they found none to counsel that they go thither. In the meantime, while the Franks were thus speaking together, lo and behold, the emperor went himself back into Constantinople. And when he was come thither, most bitterly was he reproached both by the ladies and by the damsels, and by one and another of his people, for that he had not attacked folk so few in number as were the Franks, with so great a multitude as he was leading. Unquote. And that night, Alexios III, this usurper emperor, flees the city of Constantinople altogether with a few companions and a thousand pounds of gold. What he could gather from the imperial treasury. And in the morning, the citizens of Constantinople decide that with Alexios III gone, there's really no reason to fight anymore, and they release Isaac II, the old emperor, the blind, imprisoned emperor, they release him from prison, and they reproclaim him as emperor and offer to surrender to the Crusaders. Well, this puts Boniface and Enrico Dandolo in a quandary. If they refuse, they are refusing a surrender from the rightful emperor. Right? This blows up all of their propaganda that they were going to help Alexios IV regain his rightful throne, right? Now, on the other hand, if they accept the surrender, Alexios IV will not be emperor. Right, His father Isaac will be, and Alexios will therefore not be in any position to fulfill his promises and pay them all this money and you know, force the patriarch of Constantinople to submit to the Pope and all those things. So the two sides negotiate. And on August 1st, 1203, an agreement is reached whereby Alexios IV and Isaac II will be co-emperors. And this seems to satisfy everyone, but the fact remains that the Byzantine Empire is in no position to pay the Crusaders everything that Alexios had promised. And Alexios III is still a threat. He's up in Thrace, modern-day Bulgaria, raising a new army and gathering loyalists and Alexios IV has to deal with fighting him, and even so, he is able to raise half of the money that he has promised the Crusaders. He's able to raise 100,000 marks, but he's only able to do this by raiding some Thracian towns, which you know, makes some of those people angry, and, and he depletes the entire treasury, and he ends up having to melt down some religious icons into silver to pay some of this debt, so that very much annoys many of the religious folks in the empire. He is alienating his own subjects, even as he's trying to pay a debt that he cannot pay. He finally realizes that there's no way he's going to be able to come up with all this money, and he refuses to pay any more. Towards the end of 1203, some of the French lords go to him to demand an installment on his debt, and he refuses. And here is what Robert of Clary says. He says, quote, The barons, when they heard this, took counsel what they would do, until the Doge of Venice said that he would go and speak to him. So he took a messenger and sent word to him that he should come and speak with him above the harbor. And the emperor came thither on horseback. But the doge bade four galleys be manned, and he went on board one of them, and bade the three others go with him to guard him. And he spoke to the emperor and said thus, Alexius, what thinkest thou to do? Mind thyself that we have delivered thee out of a grievous captivity, and have made thee lord and crowned thee emperor. Wilt thou not hold it all to our agreement, nor fulfill any more of them? 
Nay, quoth the emperor, I will fulfill no more of them than I have fulfilled. Wilt not, quoth the doge. Naughty lad, we have raised thee off the dunghill, and on the dunghill we will cast thee back again. I disown thee, and know thou of a surety that I will work on thee all the evil that is in my power from this day forward. Unquote. Alexios IV has overplayed his hand without the support of either the Crusaders or most of his own people, his position is more precarious than he realizes. And meanwhile, Enrico Dandolo's greed is about to put an end to the Byzantine Empire and to any hope of reconciliation between the Church in the West and the Church in the East. We'll discuss that and more in part two of An Example of Perdition. Again, it's Dan, and I'm back to remind you that there is much, much more to relevant history on Patreon. If you click the Patreon link in the episode description and sign up for the very low and reasonable price of $5 per month, you will get access to our private Discord server for Patreon members, where I'm available most days, and you will also get access to a free monthly video, which I'm sure you will enjoy since it stars yours truly. Finally, Patreon members get a shout out when they sign up, so you will hear your own name at the beginning of a relevant history episode, which I'm sure is worth far more to you than any other reward. But if financial support doesn't work for you, that is just fine. Relevant history will always be free on all platforms, and you can still help us grow our audience. You can do this by leaving a review on Apple Music or Google Music or Spotify or wherever you listen. Or if you're listening on a video site like YouTube, well, hit the like button. That helps us reach more people. Finally, share with your friends. If you found this episode valuable or found another episode valuable, let other people know and see if they can't join the family here. And for all the latest news, make sure to follow me on Facebook. You can find the show there at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R Podcast. And you can also find us on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R Podcast. Finally, if you'd like to reach out for any reason, whether because you like the show or because I got something completely wrong and you want to correct me, well, send me an email. You can reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R Podcast at gmail.com. And finally... For everything else, including my blog, which I may start updating in the future, you can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.